Oh Lord, we have been worshiping you here in song and now we get to worship you specifically thinking about the cross, remembering your blood that was shed and your body that was given as we celebrate, celebrate communion, as we celebrate your supper. Pray that your name would be lifted up and magnified. And it's always in your great name we pray. Amen. As we're going to spend time in God's word, we want to make sure that everyone has a copy of God's word in their hand. So if you do not have a copy of a Bible, go ahead and raise your hands and the men here will hand those out to you. Today we're going to be in Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Please open your Bibles and turn there. As you're turning there, you may notice here and in other places throughout the Old Testament, the word Lord is in all capital letters. Our English translations do this intentionally because this word is unique. Often the word for Lord, not all caps, is the Hebrew word Adonai. However, here the word translated Lord in all capital letters is the Hebrew word Yahweh. The word Yahweh is the personal name of the covenant-keeping God of Israel. He first revealed himself as Yahweh when he appeared to Moses in a blazing fire in the midst of a burning bush. And since then, Moses has been privileged to be in the physical presence of Yahweh a number of times. And here, in this context, in Exodus chapters 33 and 34, Moses is back on top of Mount Sinai speaking with Yahweh. Moses is petitioning Yahweh to know him, to know his ways, and to see his glory. Moses longs for this intimacy, this exposure to Yahweh. In chapter 33, verse 18, Moses says, I pray you, show me your glory. And, and in the following verse, in verse 19, God responds, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of Yahweh before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and sh show compassion on whom I will show compassion. God is going to proclaim the name of Yahweh. This is not simply stating the word Yahweh. He's going to proclaim and declare who he is, all his goodness, his nature, his character. God's character and his attributes are on display throughout all of Scripture. But here in verses uh, 6 and 7 of chapter 34, we get to see God proclaiming and declaring these things about himself. So Moses went down off the mountain, came back up the next morning, and that leads us into our passage this morning. Please follow along as I read Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 and 7. Then Yahweh passed in front of him, Moses, and proclaimed, Yahweh, Yahweh God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. We don't have time to unpack everything here, so we are going to focus, we're going to focus in on the middle of verse 7. Yahweh, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Yahweh forgives. That word forgives literally means to take up and carry away. And here in this verse, he forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Iniquity is wrongdoing or wickedness with the focus on the guilt that is incurred from doing so. Transgression is essentially a crime with the emphasis on the rebellious nature of the crime. And sin is simply missing the mark, falling short of the standard. All of these recognize that there is a divine standard. There are requirements for holy living. 
There are things we ought to do and say and think, and there are things we ought not to do and say and think. Humanity falls woefully short of this divine standard. And by doing so, every individual has incurred a guilty verdict in the courtroom of God. But he, God, is a forgiving God. It's not something that he simply does once in a while. It's in his nature. It's in his character. It's part of what defines him. He forgives. He takes up and carries away the guilt of iniquity, transgression, and sin. Looking back in the middle of verse 7, we also see, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Another part of God's character is that he is a just God. We can all recognize if a man committed a murder, he did it, he admitted to it, the evidence is clear, and the jury came back with a guilty verdict. But the judge decided to simply let that man go free? We would all say that's unjust. Justice demands that that man be punished according to his crime. And in the courtroom of God, we are all found guilty. And he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. God's justice demands that we be punished according to our crimes. And when that crime is rebelling against an infinitely holy God and falling short of his perfect holy standard, a just punishment is an eternal punishment. So how do we reconcile a just God who punishes the guilty with a forgiving God that takes up and carries away that guilt? How do we reconcile that? God will punish every single sin of every single person. And all of these sins are punished in only one of two ways. Either the sinner rightly spends eternity in hell under God's holy wrath, or Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, bears the wrath of God at the cross in the place of the sinner. Jesus never fell short, never rebelled, he perfectly met God's holy standard. And in the greatest act of grace and mercy shown humanity, Jesus, the very Son of God, suffered the wrath of God at the cross and died. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us that God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. A forgiving God and a just God is perfectly reconciled at the cross. How does a guilty sinner obtain forgiveness? This forgiveness. Jesus tells us that it's for those that repent of their sins and believe in what he accomplished at the cross. In a moment, we're going to take a, a cracker and we're going to take a little cup of juice that represents the body of Jesus that he gave at the cross and the blood of Jesus that was shed there. And we're going to take these symbols and remember those things. However, this is a time only for believers, for those that have repented and believed. If you would, by your own admission, say that you don't believe the things that I've just said, that you've just heard, that you haven't repented of your sins, then we would simply ask that you would pass the tray by when it comes. However, Consider that you are only a heartbeat away from standing before God where you will be found guilty and you will be punished accordingly. Please talk to the person who brought you. Talk to me. Talk to any one of the pastors. We'd love to discuss what it is to repent and believe in Christ. Believer, God declares about himself that he is a forgiving God and that all of your iniquity, transgression, and sin has been taken up and carried away and placed on Christ at the cross. And because of what Jesus has accomplished there, you will, on one glorious day, stand before God blameless with great joy. When your hearts are prepared, please take communion on your own.